everyone. So let's talk about something simple. How do I live a good life? How do I live a flourishing life? How do I become a good human being? Now, we kind of think that's tough to do, but at least we think we know the answers to it. And let's just lay those out kind of quickly. Um, what I should do is I should look within. I should try to find myself, find my true self. And once I find myself, I should try to strive to be sincere and authentic to who I really am, deciding in my life what to do, how to, to, to do things on a daily basis, but what to do on a bigger level too, my future career, partners, etc., based on what is really me. And part of that is, of course, I should learn to love myself and embrace myself for who I really am, uh, loving myself for my good sides, of course, but you know, loving myself for my bad sides. So I may just be someone who gets angry at little things. I sometimes have a bad temper, but that's just me. And I should love myself for who I am. And as long as I do that, embracing myself, loving myself, then I can strive to live my life on my own terms. And luckily, we have lots of things that can help us do this, right? We can take personality tests that will give us, if you, you answer them very carefully, it'll give you a sense of exactly who you are as a person. And then what would be a good career for you and what would be a good partner for you. And we help ourselves guide in trying to do this. So if you're applying to, say, college, you're in high school, and we'll say, write a college admissions essay trying to present who you really are, how all of your activities have really led you to being who you are, and therefore what's going to propel you forward. When we're asking people about a future career, same thing. We say, you know, find yourself, think about who you are, and think about what would work well for you. And when we think this, we think, luckily, I mean, it's tough to always do, but luckily we can do this. It means we can live true, liberated lives, and we can decide for ourselves what to do. And we often will, too, put this in kind of a larger vision of the world, wherein we, luckily, can do these things. We can live true, liberated lives, being true to ourselves, because we're you know, modern people. We live in the modern world. And this is unlike those people, sadly for them, who lived in traditional societies. Traditional societies where they had to do things like rituals, for example, right? Rituals that would actually tell you what to do, as opposed to letting you decide for yourself what to do. Rituals that would socialize you into certain ways of being, certain assumptions about the world, instead of letting you choose for yourself what's best for you. And they, you know, all of these people who lived before us, stuck in these traditional societies, couldn't do what we now can do. So, luckily for us, we can find ourselves. So, let me just begin with an opening question. What if we're wrong? What if we're wrong not just empirically about so-called traditional societies, which, as we'll see, were a little more complicated than we think? What if we're wrong at a more fundamental level, too? What if we're wrong about the self? What if we have a really dangerous, restricted, limited view of the self? What if we're wrong about how we can grow as human beings? And what if some of these ideas that we relegate to so-called traditional societies maybe we're onto something that we should take seriously, that we should really allow to challenge our fundamental assumptions. What if, in other words, we have rendered most of humanity as being someone or being something from which we can learn nothing, and what if that very move is a very dangerous one? So, to make this argument, let me turn to some classical Chinese views of the self. Classical China, certainly, as traditional, according to, we think, our definition of the term as you could be. But let's talk about their view of the self, their view of ritual, their view of how we could live a flourishing life, and what it might mean for us were we to take it seriously. So let's begin with that self, this thing that we keep trying to look within and find. Let me talk a bit about classical Chinese views of the self. And I'll forewarn you, at first it's going to sound a little bleak, but bear with me. But here's the bleak stuff. Do we have one true self that we should be looking within and finding? No. No, what we are is a mess. We are a mess of different energies and dispositions and desires and faculties. And we're all equally messes, equally messes. And the ways that we interact in the world is we encounter other people, other messes in other words, and we're constantly dragging out, pulling out from each other different responses. So someone will smile at me, 
I get happy in this way of thinking, that person's smile drags out from me the energy of happiness. Then someone yells at me. And it drags out from me an energy of anger. And we are largely passive in the world, endlessly being dragged and pulled different ways emotionally by, based on things we immediately encounter, purely passively. And then it gets much bleaker. Because what also happens from, again, a very young age is we fall into patterns and ruts in these responses. So someone smiles at me and someone yells at me, right? But then someone else smiles at me or doesn't smile at me. Someone does something that reminds me emotionally of that moment when someone smiled at me. And it equally drags out for me an emotion of happiness. Someone does something that emotionally reminds me, for whatever reason, of someone who yelled at me. It drags out for me an emotion of anger. And what happens from a very young age is that we cease to even respond passively to the world around us, which is bad enough, we start responding by patterns that we fall into. Patterns in which I will simply be constantly responding to the world that isn't even there because it reminds me of previous events. And these patterns in which I'm happy and sad and angry and resentful and jealous, all of these patterns become so embedded in me that it defines how I experience the world how I build relationships, how I even see what's around me, or more importantly, usually don't see what's around me. In fact, these patterns become so embedded in my entire way of being that I begin to call them me. I begin to associate them with just my personality, my characteristics, because they so dominate how I experience the world. And putting it bleakly, these patterns continue week after week, Month after month, decade after decade, they define us. They define us as human beings, repeating these patterns endlessly. Now, if they're right, and I might add, scarily, there are now tons of psychological experiments arguing that yes, this vision basically is right. This is what we're like as human beings. Note immediately that if you then say to someone, you know, you're having a tough time. You just need to find yourself. And you just need to love yourself for who you really are. Note, what you're loving yourself for is a bunch of patterns and ruts that you've fallen into. What you're embracing yourself for and what you're defining your life by are patterns and ruts. In short, if they're right about this, the last thing you want to be doing is loving yourself and finding this inner self that you think is you. What you want to do, and I'll use one of their terms attributed to a figure called Confucius, what you want to do is overcome the self. What you want to do is conquer the self. The self being understood is simply these patterns and ruts that define us. And if that's true, how do you do it? Well, one of the key things you do is you follow rituals. The very thing that we associate with these traditional worlds, the very thing we associate as, you know, what's bad because it tells us what to do. So let's look at their view of ritual. Why do you do ritual, assuming this notion of the self that we've been discussing? Here's why you do ritual. You do ritual because rituals force you for that brief moment to become a different person to see the world from a different perspective, to interact with those around you in a slightly different way. And the idea is, by doing that, you're not being socialized into thinking this ritual world is the real world. You're doing it because it breaks you from your patterns. It breaks you from the usual way you're seeing the world, and it opens up other possibilities. Let me give you one of their examples to give a sense of what this means. Let's talk about one of those relationships that um, I'm glad to say I do not understand because I have a wonderful relationship with the equivalent of what I'm about to speak about, but let's talk about one of those relationships that can sometimes be a bit problematic. Fathers and sons. 
Now, I have a wonderful father and a wonderful relationship, so I don't understand this, but some people will know that sometimes some complexities develop. It's a loving, wonderful relationship with the father helping the son, and the son striving to be like the father, but because of the same factors, other emotions kind of set in, right? All of the angers and jealousies and resentments that can set in in any hierarchical relationship, where the father, yes, wants the son to succeed, but the son is always not failing, I mean, always failing, not quite succeeding, the son's feeling both trying to be like the father, but a little bit rebellious, and you get these very dangerous dynamics that begin setting in. So how do you solve it? Do you have the two sit down and have a nice chat? Well, if we're these passive creatures that fall into these patterns that define us, no, you can talk and talk until you're blue in the face. You're still gonna fall back into your patterns. So here's what you do. What you do, in this case, is you enter a ritual in which each was forced to play the role of the other one. The father has to play the son of his own son. So he has to look at his own son as if he were his father. And the son has to play the role of the father of his own father, looking at his own father as if he were the son. Being forced over and over again to enter this ritual space and see the world not just from a different perspective, but from the different perspective. The perspective of the person with whom they have the most tensions. And you're forced to do it over and over again. The son learning from a young age what it's like to be in a position of authority. All the responsibility and yes, potential arrogance that can set in. The father being forced again to remember what it's like to be in a subservient position and each being forced to see the world from the opposite perspective begins a break in their usual relationship. Now, take that example and then imagine you're doing these rituals all the time with all of the complicated relationships that define you. The goal of which, of course, is not to socialize you into that way of thinking. You're not being socialized to stick with this example to think of your son as your father. You're being forced to break your patterns. And where does this take you? Well, let me again give one of their examples before I get to ourselves. Here's one of their examples. A figure who was seen as someone who spent his life, yes, doing these rituals in this sense of the term. His name, you've probably heard of him, he's already popped up once, Confucius. Seen as someone who spent his life doing this, as someone who, as he's described toward the end of his life, who could simply enter a situation since all the patterns playing out around him because he's gotten so good at sensing this and sense immediately the little things he can do, gestures, quotations, statements, little things he can do to break these patterns, alter the situation, and open up new possibilities. That's what he's training himself to do. And now, let's turn to ourselves. Suppose they're onto something. Suppose they're onto something about the notion of the self and how we could become better human beings. Note what this would mean. Not only are we not loving ourselves and embracing ourselves for who we are, what we're really trying to do is the opposite. We're trying to break these patterns that we see as dominating us. We're training ourselves to constantly create these little breaks. Note, we don't have to do rituals in the usual way that we think of rituals. You're doing little things all the time to create these breaks. When you get in these difficult relationships, in other words, relationships, or you have difficult family dynamics, in other words, a typical family, what you're doing are these little breaks, these little shifts, something so simple as the family's fighting, it's, it's a miserable evening, everyone's coming back from their work and school, and you simply set the dinner in a way that creates a different atmosphere, you light the candles, you create a calm situation, and people begin talking to each other, outside of the angers and jealousies and resentments. And then you do the equivalent of that constantly, all the time. And you're training yourself over time to be able to sense the complexity of situations, to be able to sense, yes, the world is messy, that I'm not a person, those around me are not particular people that I think they are, and all the difficulties I'm in, this person has a bad temper, this person's friendly, it's not them, it's patterns. I'm doing things that are creating certain patterns in others. I can change those and I can change others. And what you're gaining over time through your daily mundane life is a sense that the ways we live our daily lives, we can actually, instead of falling into these patterns, 
train ourselves to sense situations, train ourselves to do things that can create worlds at a minimal and very high level as well, in which people around us can begin to flourish. You're training yourself to do that in mundane situations at the larger level too, larger societal issues. What are the larger patterns playing out? What are the trajectories of those patterns? How do I do things that can alter those patterns? And if you're thinking of your life this way, what it means is a constant work of breaking these patterns, sensing the world around you, sensing how to create situations within which humans can flourish, and that is an extraordinary vision. It's a vision in which, yes, these ideas that we relegate to the past because of our patterned way of thinking about the traditional past are seen as alive, things from which we can learn, things that we can use to break, to use the word again, our own assumptions, and from which we can learn. Do that, and we begin to create a truly cosmopolitan world, a world in which we are training ourselves not to be who we already are, but in which we are training ourselves to create worlds in which we can flourish and become things that we currently cannot even imagine. That is an extraordinary vision of what we potentially could be as human beings. Thank you so much. Thank you.